Hi, this is John Gardner, Professor of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at Boise State University. Welcome to Module 1, Part 2 of Industrial Energy Efficiency Process Cooling. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the hardware that makes up these industrial systems. So we're going to start by a quick overview of the different kinds of systems you're likely to see in an industrial setting. And then uh, just a pictorial tour of what these devices look like. So you can recognize them when, you, when you're in the... Uh, um, on a tour of an industrial plant. So this is a, a very rough classification of cooling systems uh, that I put together through my own experience and through talking with other industrial assessment center directors. So uh, the, the first division is uh, between once through and recirculating systems. Uh, we'll talk about once through in the next slide. But the bulk of what we're looking at are recirculating systems. And those are ones that use water directly and, and they, they go through either a, a radiator type device outside or a, or a cooling tower. We'll talk about those. And then there's ones that use the vapor compression cycle in a thermodynamic cycle to to pump the heat away from an area of uh, low temperature to an area of higher temperature. And within the vapor compression cycle are DX units, direct expansion units, and those are the typical things in your home refrigerator or home air conditioning system where the refrigerant carries the heat or is the main process that carries the heat throughout the entire system. In industrial settings or large buildings, chillers are more common where all the um, refrigeration refrigerant stays in one unit and and its tra heat is transferred to another working fluid, a secondary working fluid, usually water or water glycol mixture. And then there's the uh, the high end refrigeration systems, uh, usually using ammonia as, or increasingly carbon dioxide as the refrigerant. Um, and those can be multi-stage and, and much more complex. So we'll kind of do a quick overview of all of those here. So back to the beginning, the once through system, this is the the uh, probably the cheapest in terms of upfront costs and the cheapest in terms of energy. So we use water from the tap or maybe from a well and you run it through a, like a shell and tube or a plate and frame heat exchanger. Um, that water is usually pretty cold in the you know around 50 Fahrenheit. Um, it picks up the heat from whatever system you're working on and that, so the warmer water is then discharged either into the sewer or into a river or something like that. Like I said, it doesn't cost very much to run. It's just pumping costs, but it uses water, and water is is increasingly valued uh, in our society and and in industry. And so, it's not really used all that often. It's not a very good use of, of water. Um, but if it's a if it's a low volume situation, or if it's a one of a kind, or not done very often, you might see this. But what's more common are, are various kinds of recirculating. Um, system. So here's a, a figure that Kelly Kissack, the director of the Industrial Assessment Center at the University of Dayton, has put together where we, we have um, chilled water coming from a tank through various machines and devices out in the field and in the plant that might be requiring that water. And then the water then, is, as it warms up, is pumped out into an outside cooling tower. And we'll look at the design of these cooling towers in a, in a minute. Uh, but there's two pumps, and it's a, but it's a common system all the water works together you could do the same idea but instead of using a cooling tower you could just use either a chiller or a, um, a, a an air driven um, evaporator or I'm sorry an air driven cooler outside that's that's called a fluid cooler if you do it that way um, and and again the, in this case the, the the fluid the working fluid the water all stays within one um, in in a closed system so they're relatively inexpensive and they're robust. They work pretty well. But if it's a dry system, you can't get the water any cooler than the outdoor temperature, right? In fact, you can't even get it that cold. You need a, you need a delta T to reject the heat out there. So if you're trying to, to do anything below, say, you know, 80 or 90 or even maybe even 70 or 60 degrees in the milder weather, you can't do it because you can't get the working fluid any cooler than that. If you have a cooling tower, you use the evaporative power of water to... to to take the heat away and that can drive the temperature down to the wet bulb temperature. It could be as much as 10 or 20 degrees cooler than the outside temperature depending on how, humidity, how humid it is, um, but you lose water. The water is evaporating. Um, and so if you have really large cooling loads, meaning lots of heat that has to be removed, uh, then you do that by evaporating large amounts of water. 
Uh, and so these systems aren't suitable in and of themselves for, say, refrigeration, for getting things down into the into the either the cold storage area of you know 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or certainly into the freezing uh, area of into the negative Fahrenheit range. So that gets us into the vapor compression cycle, and I just show a generic temperature entropy diagram on the right here, showing what a typical one looks like. Uses uh, the thermodynamics of a refrigerant, uh, some kind of a either a hydrofluorocarbon or uh, ammonia or increasingly carbon dioxide, um, and it pumps the heat from an area of lower temperature to an area of higher temperature. One of those kinds of units is the DX, the direct expansion units, uh, typical in the air-to-air -air heat pump realm, and, and that is your home air conditioning unit. That's a refrigerator. That's your home freezer. Um, it, you, you will see these in small industrial loads, but typically not for anything of any size. It's limited by um, the cost of the refrigerant, so really high capacity uh, DX units need a lot of refrigerant, and this can be a, a considerable expense. And the length of the pipes, you, you, there, there, you, there's only a, um, the more you have to move the refrigerant, the less effective it is. And that brings us to the next level of uh, modularization, which would be chillers. So chiller is a direct expansion unit that's, that's built in with a couple of heat exchangers, where one heat exchanger takes the, it, it links up with the evaporator of the DX unit, which chills some water, which is then used for whatever refrigeration load you're using, whether it's an HVAC system or a, or a refrigerator or freezer. And then the other uh, heat exchanger is the condenser of the DX unit, which heats up water, which is then uh, taken off to, say, a cooling tower or some other device outside where the heat is rejected, commonly used in commercial buildings. So you'll see chillers often in the machine room, probably of the, of the building, you know, the, most of the buildings you take your classes in on a college campus will have a chiller or several chillers in it. Um, they're they're fairly inexpensive for moderate loads and temperatures. In other words, they're perfect for building HVAC. They're not so good for freezers, industrial freezers. But one of the reasons they're so popular is because they're they've become very commoditized. They're you know a 200 ton chiller can be made by six different manufacturers, so there's good competitive pressure to keep the prices low. So this is a, a typical arrangement of using a chiller um, in an industrial setting. You'll use the chiller to, to cool water on the right-hand side, and that, that's the water that's being used to uh, take heat away from the processes, whether it's, um, you know, maybe it's for um, chilling milk after you've pasteurized it, for example. So these loads we show here could, could be heat exchangers. And on the other side of the chiller, uh, the, the heat is being pumped over to this other working fluid, which then could be using a cooling tower on the roof to use the evaporation. And what's not shown here is that as some of this water evaporates, you need to add new water to make up the, the evaporative water. So, and that takes us to probably the most com or most complicated uh, kinds of systems we'll see, which is I'm referring to the industrial refrigeration system. Large food processors are great examples of this. These tend to be built up systems. In other words, they're designed um, for that customer. You don't you know, open up a catalog and order one of these systems. You have to hire a firm that'll engineer them for you. Uh, they're very expensive. But uh, from a standpoint of energy, you know, kilowatt hour of electricity versus BTU of heat removed, they tend to be very efficient. But on the other hand, they use a lot of energy. To, to move large amounts of, of heat. Um, typical for very large loads, big warehouses, uh, or and or very low temperatures. So freezer warehouses, um, are it's not unusual to walk into a, one of these things and it's minus five Fahrenheit. It's very, very cold. They're, uh, they're, these really large systems are almost exclusively used with ammonia. Okay, so the core of these is the vapor compression cycle. We're going to spend the next module really talking about reviewing the vapor compression cycle and the thermodynamics of it. But there are four main components in any one of these things. There's the compressor itself, which takes the refrigerant in the vapor phase and takes it to a very high pressure and, and hence a high temperature that goes to the condenser. Uh, usually that's where the heat's rejected, that's the outside unit, um, and, and that vapor is then condensed to a liquid 
when you expand the liquid through a throttling valve, it gets very cold, uh, and, it, and it exits the throttling valve as a um, a mixture within the saturation region, and that goes through the evaporator where um, it absorbs heat um, at this very low temperature and evaporates back into a, a vapor phase and goes through the cycle again. So we're going to go through that analysis, like I said, in the next module. Um, but let's see what these things look like. They're, you know, so far they're blocks on these uh, generic diagrams. Let's look at some photographs out there. So we'll start with compressors, and there's various uh, elements, various, um, there's a lot of variations on this theme, but these are the most common we'll be seeing. The hermetically sealed ones. So this is if you open up the back of your refrigerator or look inside your air conditioner or your, your whole house air conditioner, you'll see one of these black cylinders with pipes sticking out of them. That's a hermetically sealed um, compressor. It's got oil in there. It does the cooling of the compression all in one spot. Um, uh, vapor comes in, low pressure, low temperature vapor goes in, high temperature, high vapor goes out. Um, they are designed to last the lifetime of the device. They can run 20, 30, 40 years all the time. They're, they're, uh, they're an amazing little piece of engineering and they've been working for a very long time this way. They are, the other side is they're not serviceable. When they do uh, go bad, you pull them out and you put a new one in. So uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you go into a big um, compressor room for a, a refrigeration uh, warehouse, and you'll see you might see these guys. These are reciprocating uh, compressors, um, also called Recips. Uh, these are two of the brands that we've seen a lot of in our visits: Vilter and Mycom. Uh, and you'll see some similarities in how they look, right? They 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 don't look all that different. Um, so these are the things you'll you'll notice when you're and how you can identify a reciprocation a reciprocating compressor. Uh, the cylinder heads are plainly visible. So I'll go back a slide here. These are the cylinder heads. Uh, so if you've ever done work on an automobile, you'll recognize these right away. Um, they also have an integrated water jacket. They need to be cooled because, like any kind of compressor, they get hot. Uh, and again, go back here, you'll see these pipes running out through the uh, cylinder heads uh, carrying the cooling water in the MICOM. Uh, and it, it's less visible in the um, other ones, but these smaller uh, pipes you see on the top of the, the filter are also part of the water jacket. They can be four cylinders, they can be 12 cylinders, there's all sorts of variations on these. They're typically belt driven, usually they're running at a lower speed than the, than the speed of an AC motor. Um, they're often used as the first stage of a multi-stage system, so they're these are sometimes called the booster stage of, a, of an ammonia system. Um, and in any kinds of any of these compressors for these more sophisticated systems, we talk about capacity control. They're not just on or off. We can we can um, control how much fluid they're moving, how much um, refrigerant they're they're compressing. In reciprocating compressors, these are done called valve unloading. Say if it's a four-cylinder compressor, there's solenoids that'll um, pop the uh, the valves. Uh, and keep them open the whole time, so they're they're just moving the f the refrigerant back and forth. They're not compressing it, uh, and it's actually a fairly efficient way of of unloading part of the compressor and and make it work less hard. Um, and it's it can be very very it's a very effective means of capacity control. In other words, it's very energy efficient. But uh, as you can imagine, it's not continuous. You either a cylinder's either loaded or unloaded. So if you have a you know a twelve cylinder system. Uh, you probably unload two cylinders at a time. So you've got six different levels of capacity you can achieve with that. Uh, you'll very rarely see variable frequency drives on these kinds of, of um, compressors. And then the other common one you'll see in these rooms, usually in conjunction with reciprocating compressors, are the scroll or the screw compressors. They both look like this. There's a direct drive motor to the compressor. The compressor is a cylindrical uh, tank on top of a bigger cylindrical tank, which is the oil separator. Uh, interestingly enough, these look a little bit like chiller units, uh, but they're not. They're not the same thing as chiller units. So uh, these uh, screw compressors are oil flooded, so the oil uh, is is mixed up with the refrigerant, and that's why you need that big um, cylinder underneath. That's the oil separator. Um, capacity control on these is done either with a slide valve, which kind of um, changes how long uh, along the axis of the screw the compression takes place, 
um, or a variable frequency drive. Um, the slide valve is not a bad way to do partial load, but it's not as good as a variable frequency drive. Okay, so those are the compressors. Now as you go um, back upstream in the direction of refrigerant flow, you'll find evaporators. This is the this is where um, this is where it picks up the heat. This is the cold part. Uh, here's a picture in the back of a refrigerator, um, serpentine coil with fins. Um, while the refrigerant's moving through here, it starts in as a liquid vapor phase, and it eventually boils throughout the process. And as it exits, it's it should be um, superheated vapor. Um, there's often a fan to move the air through here, and, and what we see here is a picture with a little bit of frost. Uh, not uncommon if there's any humidity in the air, and certainly in food processing, there's always humidity in the air. Um, the frost, uh, you know, the humidity condenses on the cold, um, on the cold coils and the fins, uh, and, and, and creates these frost uh, buildups, which, which limits the, the airflow and limits the heat transfer and generally has to be removed periodically. So if you go through these big warehouses, you'll see units. Uh, I've seen both of these kind of units in a, in a walk-in freezer or in a walk-in warehouse. They're usually up high. They're, they're taking the warmer air that has risen to the top of the warehouse, cooling it, and then it drops down as, as, after, as it goes through. So on the other end, this is where we have to reject the heat, the condensers, uh, usually on the roof. Um, and there's two very common. There's a evaporative condenser and the cooling tower. These look really similar. Okay, so the, on the right is the condenser. It's part of a vapor compression cycle. Um, and we see um, there's water circulating from above and below, water sprayed on, on fins, and then there's a fan that blows air against the water. The water evaporates. It takes heat away from these this condenser, from the, the the condenser uh, that where the refrigerant's running through. On the left-hand side is the cooling tower that we've talked about earlier, where we have uh, the water that's coming, say, from the chiller running through uh, a medium with air being blown against it, and then the water that's collected goes back to the chiller. So, so these look when you look when you first look at them on the top of a building, they look very similar. But I want to I want to take a little bit of time to point out the difference. So, for example, the cooling tower on the left only has two places where there's fluid hooked up, two pipes hooked up to it, right? The hot water entering and the cold water going back. Uh, the, the second one, the evaporative condenser, is more complicated because you've got the recirculating water and also the refrigerant coming and going. So here's some pictures of, of cooling towers that, that we'll see. So first of all, there's the power plant cooling towers. So you see them in any, any power plant, I don't know, built in the last 30 years or so of these big hyperbolic cooling towers, usually big plumes of steam coming off of them. Um, the Evapco one in the center is, is typical of what you see in the back of a, you know, on top of a commercial building or maybe outside. Um, and then over on the lower right hand side are um, cooling, fluid coolers using just air. There's not, there is an evaporating, air, there isn't an evaporation process going on there. So, so here's on, here's two of these devices. That one of these is a cooling tower. One of these is an evaporative condenser. Um, you know, so I want you to kind of think about this. Maybe even pause the video for a second and convince yourself which one's which. Okay, based on what we've seen so far. So I'm gonna. I really want you to stop and and think about this for a little bit. So assuming you've already done that, let's uh, go on to the next slide and say that the cooling towers, as I mentioned, has very simple plumbing. Basically, there's an inlet on the top where the hot water goes in. There's an outlet on the bottom that goes back to where it is. You, you probably won't even see the pump near here. The pump is probably inside. Um, you do have to make up some water, but that's uh, usually, again, done inside. You don't usually see that up here. Evaporative condensers are more complicated. You'll, you'll have a recirculating pump, usually right at the condenser, and that's what we see here on this Evapco picture. Uh, and then more um, lines for the, um, for the refrigerant. Um, and so on the left-hand side is the evaporative condenser I showed you on the previous slide, and here's another one uh, with the plumbing installed. So the green pipe you see here, and a little bit in the background on the other one, is the recirculating water, and the, the uh, blue pipes here are the refrigerant. Uh, and of course, um, the reality is messy. You walk into any of these plants, uh, you may or may not have color coding. Uh, it, it may be um, pretty clear which 
compressor is doing what, but generally speaking, you're going to spend some time trying to figure this out. Uh, I, 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 the first time I did one of these five years ago at a big plant out in Pocatello, I was literally blown away. Um, and so, so the, the bottom line is it takes patience, it takes time. Uh, the good news is for ammonia systems that need the labeling is required. And so once you get to know the, the jargon, um, and the abbreviations, it gets a, it gets a little bit easier. You can start following the, the path, the main path of the, um, of the refrigerant. So that's it. That's what we wanted to talk about. Um, these systems are complicated, but they're not impossible to figure out. We're engineers. We can, we can, we can walk through this. Um, but uh, once they're up and running, uh, the operators really don't want to mess with them. Our job as efficiency engineers is to go in there and say, hey, I think if you tweak your, your system, you can, you can do this with less energy. Um, we have to really know what we're talking about to get their trust because their job is to make sure that the french fries or the salmon fillets or whatever it is they're processing get cold and stay cold. And if the refrigeration system breaks, that doesn't happen and the company loses a lot of money so operators know are, you know they're 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 uh, chosen to be conservative they don't want to mess with this system very much um, these components are designed for specific operating conditions or sized for specific operating conditions but those conditions change right i mean usually the design temp there's a design temp for a region of the country you designed for 95 degrees well you know it's it can be 105 degrees down here in the Boise area um, and it's and, and it can be you know freezing so so there's this whole range of operation and if you design the system for the worst case scenario you're wasting energy a lot of the time of the year so that's one of our opportunities that we'll look at so so that wraps up uh, module one that's a lot of content um, hopefully you've uh, Follow that and absorbed it. Maybe you want to rewatch the video, uh, and uh, and uh, good luck on the problem set. Mm -hmm.